this narrative around Black men and mental health, that it is mm. not a path of healing for you, that it is not available and not because of any other reason than like pride. I kind of think of it as the Black people's machismo. Like it's not something that is available because you have to be strong at all points, because you cannot cry, because you don't got time, you don't got the luxury to feel these feelings um, or to have mental health issues. And also in our communities, if, if either of you are from religious communities, I know you've heard this, that basically you're a sinner and that's why you got some mental health issue. Like, yeah. and you just need to pray it away. Repeat after me. I bring more than diversity. I bring irreplaceable perspectives. Hey friends, my name is Whitney and I'm the host of Impostrix Podcast, the show that validates professionals of color navigating imposter syndrome and racial toxicity in their career. Join us and be validated. You got this. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Whitney Knox Lee. I am the host of Impostrix Podcast. I am excited to be here with you all taking over Pandora Awareness, um, YouTube, and all the other links that this is going to. Um, I'm really excited to be co-hosting this conversation today with my friend Asher Wright. Um, we've got with us Marlon Bacote, and we are going to be talking about mental health. We're going to be talking about incarceration and returning to the workforce after incarceration and all of the things if you're unfamiliar with me, I'll go ahead and do my little podcast shout out right now. Um, I'm the host of Impostrix Podcast. Like I said, we talk about validating professionals of color, navigating imposter syndrome and racial toxicity within their careers. And in April, we will be doing a special feature on uh, incarceration and returning to work after incarceration because April is Second Chances Month, where we like to focus on awareness around what the U.S. is doing around mass incarceration and how incarceration impacts the lives of ourselves, our communities, and the millions of people that it touches every second of every day. Um, so I'm going to kick it to Asher um, to introduce yourself, and then we'll kick it to Marlon. Wow, that was beautiful, Whitney. Thank you so much for, for starting us off today because I'm, I'm, I'm the tech guy today, man. If you guys want to, I'm the tech guy today. But again, um, I host the Ponderers Awareness Podcast along with my co-host, Queen Lab, but she's not here today because Sunday's our, it's just a special special day for us with Marlon today. And I'm teaming up with Whitney Knox. Uh, we've been chatting for a while. We've been trying to do this thing for a while. And it, it, it's not the first time we try to pull this off, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, but today we're going to pull it off with Marlon. So we're going to talk with Marlon today about his story. But a little bit about me. I was, um, I've was i been in the United States 25 years. 22 of those 25 years, I sure have in the United States military. I retired from it. So now I consider myself an immigrant and a veteran, right? That's, that's the two, that's the two uh, and identity that I really, really find a lot of passion and purpose in. Because when I was in the military, the big question that, that kind of drive me was, who do you want to be a hero to, Asher? And that big question kind of drive my life. The answer to that question was the American family, the American population, because it was worth my sacrifice. So I did 22 years serving those folks. And same thing when I leave the military, the big question was, who do you want to be a hero to again? And the answer to that was my immigrants and my veterans, because those two communities kind of helped me survive the military. So now I'm focused on my passion towards serving them. And I know Marlon got a passion for a lot of things, but I know he got... Definitely a passion for the mental space. So I'm going to turn up to Marlon to kind of talk about his journey. <laughs> we can jump off today. Hi, everyone. I'm Marlon Baycoat, author of Lighting the Way, Hidden Treasures, found on Amazon Kindle. Um, and I um, am a person who has experienced a great deal of mental health and substance use disorder issues over the past 30 years. During that time, I... Uh, as a peer, someone who was treated, misdiagnosed, uh, abused, um, stigmatized, put down, incarcerated because of addiction. And I say that directly as a result of addiction. I spent a total of 25 years incarcerated for petty crimes to support my habit under old Virginia law. Uh, real briefly, when George Floyd was murdered, there was a sweep of criminal justice reform across the country. I wrote the General Assembly here in Virginia, and they they took those same laws that locked me up off the books. So no longer does anyone have to go to prison for two decades for 
less than a hundred dollars worth of items in order to get a fix. Um, I advocate for mental health reform. I am now a mental health professional and a substance use uh, counselor, and I work in the field directly with individuals, but I also do research for children exposed to trauma in underserved communities. My mission and my purpose uh, is to help make the world a better place through mental health reform. Awesome. Thank you, Marlon and Asher, for introducing yourselves. As I said at the outset, we are going into Second Chances Month, um, April. And if you're listening on Impostrix Podcasts, you're listening to this in April. And I want to take a moment to just acknowledge, as you said, that you're somebody who has previously been incarcerated um, and you are very much living the impact of incarceration as you are trying to navigate in the professional realm. So I would love it if you can share with us a little bit about um, what your story has been as someone who has spent so much time in prison. Um, but specifically, how did what are you doing now as your profession and how did you get there? Uh, thanks, Whitney. And it started, uh, say, in 2011 was the last charge. That was for two bottles of lotion. Went into a food line took two bottles of lotion and I ended up getting five years. Um, that, that was the, that was the camel. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. As I would say, I guess, and then uh, addiction recovery, we would call it my bottom because by that time I had done maybe already 15 years for crimes to, you know, in relation to the addiction. And I said, this is enough. I'm not getting the help I need from the system. I'm going to have to find a way to help myself, which, you know, for a lot of us dealing with mental health and addiction issues, we need help. We need the support of our professionals, our community, our family. It's important. It's most uh, one of the things we talk about the most, the support system. Well, I had to find myself in prison trying to find my own support system in a place where people are caged and locked away without a lot of rehabilitation programs. And I found uh, what I call the hope shot, which I believe everyone needs to to come out of the uh, uh, the issues and the disorders uh, that they deal with with mental health and addiction. My hope shot was trying to make my, a purpose out of my life, what I had been through. Because now I'm getting ready to serve from the 18 to the 23 years. It's 2011. Um, I did the first year. I came out and I came home and I said, things are still the same. I ended up going back to school during that time. After that 2011 charge, I got two degrees. Uh, and once I finished my two degrees, I went to church and a man said, look, you would be great as a mental health professional. I said, well, I have a bachelor's in business. Switched my degree. Two weeks later, I found myself at Liberty University in the Masters of Addiction Counseling Program. And I was also certified nationally by the International Association of Peer Support Specialists. Got my first license. I went on to get another one with the Department of Health Professions. I obtained a qualified mental health professional license. And then I acquired a certified substance abuse a counselor license. So I have currently have three licenses with the Department of Health Professions. And uh, before 2018, everything was going great, uh, was violated for a technical violation, put back in prison for two years. But also during that time, Virginia started what we call barrier crimes, which we're hoping the governor signs off on a few of those bills this year. So that won't affect people like me anymore. They, they put into law 185 barrier crimes that would prevent someone like me from working after I had already been certified and working in the field as a professional. Well, during those two years from 2018 to 2020, I was already, you know, on my path, on my journey, and I still didn't let that deter me. I went to the law library in the prison, took a typewriter out, walked across the yard, put it at my bunk. And just told everybody, the warden gave it to me. And I used that for two years. They, they were like, he couldn't have made that up. He got a typewriter. He's the only one out of 2,000 people with a typewriter. And uh, I wrote my story, my book, 
lighting the way hidden treasures because I believe pressure creates diamonds. And no matter what we go through, whether it's mental health or addiction issues, just the challenges of life create something special and beautiful inside all of us. But it's not just meant for us once we find our way out. We need to let that beauty, that treasure shine so that others can find their way. And that's who I am. And that's where I'm at today. <laughs> just trying to let the light shine for somebody that's hurting, trying to get that hope shot out, y'all. We need it. Yeah. And so the barrier crimes, those are if you're convicted of one of these 180 crimes, then you cannot work within the Virginia Department of Public Health or what is the Yes, with DBHDS, Department of Behavioral Health and Disability Services. So someone like me with anyone with a disability, elderly uh, people uh, that are uh, ID, the DD community, mental health. Any of the thing that falls under that umbrella in Virginia, you can't work with. But that's just Virginia. Um, I was able to work uh, here in Virginia at Richmond at the McShin Foundation under AmeriCorps. Pass a federal Ooh, background okay. check, get sworn in, worked a year there. New York answering the 988 suicide crisis line. I could work anywhere outside the state. Or in Virginia, just not under the DBHDS umbrella, which covers mostly people with Medicaid. So I can work in Virginia for a private agency, but if I want to work for the state and deal with people, lower income, Black people in lower income areas, I can't. I'm, I'm deemed ineligible because of the 185 barrier crimes, but it's not just that. That law that was put into effect has a five-year clause which I was taking off probation when I got out in 2020. But guess what? For the two bottles of lotion, I now have to wait until five years after 2020, after getting out of prison, to work with my licenses mm -hmm. that the state gave me in Virginia with people with Medicaid. Wow. Yeah. And we were talking about this. <laughs> Asher mentioned this before that this is not the first time we tried to have this conversation. <laughs> so we talked about this the first time we tried to record um, and just the you know for me it really seems purposeful it seems purposeful that there are systems in place to allow people with lived experience to be able to reach back and support folks who are going through literally what they have been through yeah. um but then that laws have put in, been put in place to block that interaction um you know i'm someone who's also in recovery and uh, who has dealt with mental illness and find it so powerful when we can learn with and communicate with and get hope from people who have been through what we've been through. It's a very different experience than having an academic or somebody that studied, you know, the the people, whoever, um, to come in and, and share that that information with us. That's a different experience than having somebody that's actually survived what it is that you're going through. Um, and so that blockage that you're talking about with this barrier crimes law is something that just seems so harmful, particularly to yeah. the people that these services are meant to help. Brown people, poor people who are living with Medicaid and Medicare. Um, it's, yeah. uh, Whitney, I, it's ludicrous. So the same state that gave me the license is telling me I can't work. Why even give it to me? If you know you're going to set these barriers up, why even have me go through the training? Why have me spend my time, my money, and my energy learning the education behind it so I can be certified under the Virginia Certification Board? I have two licenses for peer support that I can't use. Well, one's a certification. First, I have to get certified by the Virginia Certification Board, go through training, take exams, and pass. And, and you don't say, hey, we got these 185 barrier crimes that will, will prevent you from working. So then I do that. So then I pay the state for the Virginia Department of Health Professions to be a registered peer recovery specialist. So I have a RPRS, I have a, a CPRS, I have two certifications and licenses for the same thing that you won't let me use. And five years, I have to wait. So I got out of prison in 2020. I talked to the state police background check lady. She said, listen, you can work. If the law doesn't pass this year, you'll be clear in 2025 after you've been home from prison for five years. 
Man, listen, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm listening. I can work, it, man. I can work at home. I want to some, find these it, contracts. <laughs> it's not like it's a it's a system designed to drive you crazy. <laughs> if, if you think about it, Whew. like you said, hey man, um, go through this door. I get into this room. You can have a seat. We get into this room. Like, hey, I'm sorry, but you can't be in this room. You gotta go to another room. So it's it's like it's designed to drive you crazy. So how 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 has it been, my friend? And I know I know Whitney, you come you have a lot of background too. I was thinking about the the, the navigating the, the complexity of creating laws and then find a way to put barriers to those laws that you create. Like, how do you navigate that process? Oh, okay, because I was ready because I I've been going through it. I have maybe uh and and like I was saying, the the background check. Uh, chief of background check for the Department of Be uh, Behavioral Health and Disability Services has been working with me to help get legislation passed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in that, she sent me every time I was deemed ineligible since 2018. I have like 20 denials where I can't work, where I start these positions. I'm helping people. And like Whitney said, some of them are saying this is the best treatment I've ever had because I'm working with someone that has the same experiences as, as I've had. They understand. And when they say it, they just don't, you know, they're not just speaking off the top of their head. They're, they're speaking from the heart. Lived I give experience. my heart. I give my lived experience. And um, so in navigating that, um, like that pressure, right? You just have to, I had to be resilient. I had to find a way to still keep what I was doing. A lot of times I had to go back to cooking. Hey, I'm a, I'm a sous chef. I couldn't work in the field where I, I have a degrees and master degrees and, and, you know, and work in my field. Well, let me go cook until I can find a way to work because at times it got discouraging and that weighed on my mental health. Mm. Um, being denied, starting these great jobs and then being told, hey, your background didn't pass because of that 2011, those two bottles of lotion. Could you imagine what that felt like? But I didn't let it get me down, right? And that's why I believe people who go through things have so much power and beauty inside of them. Um, I found other ways. Like I said, I started picking up contracts with other states. I said, well, let me find some remote peer jobs. And maybe these remote jobs won't use the same criteria or the same licensing agency that Virginia uses. And that's how I began to work in the field. And that's how I work now. I'm a contractor until those laws pass. So, you know, you know what? I, I like the theme that that Whitney kind of set for here the the second chance theme because, like, we all need second chances because you know we all gonna make mistakes and sometimes the system when we think about this, we think about values, laws, and principles, right? Or rules. Those are that's what create a system. And and in you know, in order for you to break that system, you gotta change those rules. You get you gotta break that that those principles, go yeah. find new principles, you know, create different values because oftentimes that's what you go against. It's not an individual, it's a system and system will build based on those things. And it's difficult to think about it because now who's supporting that system and who you gotta go against to really <laughs> minimize that process. So right. very powerful. And it's Thank it's you. terrifying to think about because you know, I'm in a state that is run by people who say they believe in second chances. Mm. But they do other things that make one question, you know, how much they actually believe. And, you know, the criminal legal system, my opinion, uh, as somebody that's worked within the criminal legal system, is is that it's not intended for um, second chances. It's not intended for rehabilitation. It's uh, not intended for, tr for justice, at least not justice from the standpoint of poor people and of people of color. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just a web of, you know, difficult policies and, you know, rules and all of these things that can at times seem insurmountable. And that's why I always get so much inspiration and strength from people like yourself, Marlon, like Thank the, you. you know, tens and tens of clients who have, I've worked with who have, you know, come up against insurmountable, seemingly insurmountable odds um, <clears throat> to be I, able to find themselves and be themselves. Mm -hmm, go ahead. And while we're speaking about that, I didn't want to interrupt because I know we're live, but one of those things I was talking about was support and how important it is for someone 
returning citizens, people with lived experience. Um, and my support system is about to take off the work. I just wanted to give her a, my fiance a quick kiss mm. goodbye. If she can, I want to put my beautiful queen on camera. Look at okay. this beautiful queen. Okay. Want to say hi to the people. <laughs> <laughs> cool. You, you call I call that the, the express way through failure. It's support system. It's, it's a community. Yeah. If you want to make it through that fast enough, that's the express way. Those are the people you, you, you lean on that kind of come along the way and kind of help you going forward. Because without them, it's like, man, not, life is hard, difficult, very heavy. Well, and Asher, I, I was thinking about you recently because I'm rereading the book, um, The Body Keeps the Score. Mm. And it's about trauma, of course. It's about kind of overcoming trauma and the various ways that trauma impacts our bodies and our ourselves in addition to like our mental health. And I'm just at the beginning, the first couple of chapters, and the author is talking about um, how he started out, oop, sorry, how he started mm -hmm. out working um, with veterans mm -hmm. in the VA. He is not a veteran. And how he was surprised to see some of the techniques that they were using not work. Um, and what I interpreted as like a disconnect because he was not a veteran. And so at some point after, you know, so, so long working with these various groups, there becomes a point where these groups kind of adopt him as one of their own or as like, okay, you're cool. Like we'll open up to you now. And um, I was thinking about you as a veteran um, and as someone who, you know, cares deeply about mental well-being. Uh, within the veterans and immigrant communities. And I wonder um, if you can share about your experience being a veteran and um, yourself kind of getting reacclimated to what life is like when you're not actively mm -hmm. trying to protect the United States. But thank you for that question, by the way. That's very, that's very powerful, powerful for you to start off. But I'm, I'm going to share this. When you first joined the military, right? I'm going to talk about it then because I think the best way to explain it is the identity shift, the crisis of identity, identity crisis, because that's the shift. So when when I first joined the military, I get conditioned into that new value system, those new principles, those new rules. And it took a while to kind of break myself into it, kind of assimilate into it. But what was helpful is the community I was in at the time. Because when you go to that new place, trying to, trying to assimilate, people are surrounding you. It's like, hey, do it this way. We're, we're in the same team. We're doing the same thing. So I was able to, 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 to change my identity to becoming a soldier. But here's the thing, when you, when, you, when you finish the time as a soldier, you got to come back out of that system, back into civilian life. Same with, Mar with, with Marlon. Now I got to shift identity again, because for 22 years I've been a soldier. I think like a soldier, I'm thinking defensively. I'm, I'm having all these defense thoughts, offense thought and defense thought. It's a, it's, a, it's a place that really eats at your, 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 your energy because you're thinking defensively all the time. So after I leave it, I got to go back in civilian space. Now, I don't fit back in the civilian world because I've been in a community that think a certain way. But then when I leave the when I leave the military space, go back to civilian space, I don't have that brotherhood outside of it to like, hey, actually shift an identity, you know, think this way. And man, I felt like I was cut off. I felt like I was lost. Like I didn't have the support system I need. And then depression started hitting, anxiety started hitting, all those things started hitting because now this identity shift is not easy to make without the right kind of support system. And I'm I'm grateful for the VA because they have something in place. But sometimes when you're you're not used to a certain thing, adopting a certain thing, you don't really do it. Like I was too proud to go see counseling because, I mean, I grew up in a culture that doesn't support that kind of stuff. I didn't have a conversation about how I'm feeling mentally, so forth and so on. I just tough it out. But once I leave, I'm like, oh my God, all that stuff started rushing in, all those emotions start showing up. Now, what do you do with that? Who do you share that with? I don't have my brothers anymore because I kind of left that community. But I'm in a civilian space. I don't have that support system. So I came back to my family. I'm hanging out with them, but then we don't connect the same way because I've been gone for so long. So it's, it's a really hard shift in the mental space for identity shift. And that's why a lot of people lose themselves because now that was me, but I know that's no longer me. Who am I now? Like what I do with this person that, that's showing up right now, but it doesn't fit in this society right now because I operate on different rules for 20, 22 years. Same with Martin, he was, in, he was in jail. He was operating on certain different rules. You got to come back out now. How do you fit back in society? That's the, that become the challenge. So that's my best explanation for you guys. Yeah, and I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to relate, you know, being serving our country in the military with being in prison, 
but I am, you know, it is what you said about you're in one society, really, and you're in this society for so long, and then you're moving into a different society. And in um, jails and prisons, you're a piece of shit. Like, you know, mm -hmm. there's, it's one of the things that has been so amazing for me to see about folks that I'm working with are the people that are able to maintain their sense of self who reject being assigned a number and called a number or called maybe the last name. Um, the people, you know, every step of the way you're taking direction and the moment that you don't take direction, you're at risk of being sent to the hole. Um, you're at risk of getting beat. You're at risk of not eating or being retaliated against in other ways. Um, and then all of a sudden you're quote free. Um, but we know in the United States, as far as jail and prison is concerned, that your sentence doesn't end when you walk out the door. Mm. And mental health is, of course, one thing that we've that we've spoken about. But Marlon, um, and you've, of course, talked about now that you've got all of these certifications um, that you can't use them in Virginia in the way that you got them intending to use them. I'm wondering what else, what else has it been like? What's What's been maybe surprising for you as someone who is has been in and out of jails and prisons for 20 some years and now you're sober, you're working on your mental health, you've got these certificates, you've got a fiance and you've got this past. What's surprised you about what this life is, is looking like now? The biggest surprise is where I am, I would say, developmentally in my social interactions with family, because they say in addiction, you stop developing at the age you first started using. So a lot of times, even at 52, I find myself as a 19 year old in interactions in uh responsibilities and you know sometimes my fiance has to remind me hey we, we got to pay the bills um we can't go out I'm like that 19 year old hey let's have a good day. because I lost 30 years of my life um and the culture was different and even speaking on that uh I didn't I didn't change who I was I was that 19 year old that was full of life going to college in Boston who had a football injury and was introduced to the drug but had uh, dreams and aspirations of being a political science major and ambassador to the United States in some Hispanic speaking country so I would go to prisons and and jails and in the street and in, in that other society of addiction that addiction world and try to be the ambassador I'm the peacemaker I would I would actually stop riding in prison I'd be the one to say hey no we're not going to have this uh you know <laughs> and step in yeah I, I didn't change who I was and a lot of times everywhere I went people said you don't belong here you're different from everybody else and I knew it I just had to find the strength to be that person and let that person live and develop in a society like you said that didn't accept him because of the addiction now I have the felony um and and all of these things that stacked up against me as a black man in America um and I never wanted it to like I said I've always I had parents that pushed me to say push through um and that if I if I got anything from them it was to never give up and so I never gave up on myself, but I had to learn to take the mask off. We talk about that in addiction recovery. Take the mask off, you know, uh, be transparent, expose yourself. But it's so hard, like you were saying, Asher, in, in a community and in uh, a home where it's the stigma is it's not accepted. You know, you're the man. Be strong. Don't uh, expose any weakness. This society has has built around men don't cry and things like that. And we've got to get rid of all of that because everybody's hurting. Even children are hurting. And we, we, we've been teaching these children these things about what a man should look like. They see it on social media. They see it um, displayed on the media. Um, and, and it's taught to them about the the how a man should be but then at the same time they're not taught how to love each other 
Um, I was just speaking to someone about, you know, how people put up emasculating uh, uh, quotes and, and images and memes about men and society, but yet we want our young boys to respect each other. But at the same time, we put down the man who's there the image of. Um, so it's it's a lot to fight against. And and that's why I thank you too for your podcast. It's things like this that help get out the word of hope, the word of love, and the word of change, reform. And again, shout out. I forgot to shout out when I was talking about the Virginia law changing. I have to shout out two uh, agencies or societies here in Virginia that are helping make that um, one around the nation is called Reform Alliance. Shout out to Reform. If y'all don't know, they're on social media. Reform is doing big things. Whitney, have you heard of Reform Alliance? No, I haven't. Oh, wow. Yeah. Go Instagram, Facebook, reform. It's the black. You'll see me in their t-shirt somewhere. It's the white letters, uh, reform alliance. They're making changes. They actually have two bills in the house here in Virginia and they go nationwide making change for probation. And then the other one here in Virginia is Sarah. Um, I don't know what that acronym stands for. I just know they're a mental health agency and they are fighting to have those barrier crimes removed. Thank you. Um, I do want to pick up on this thread that both you and Asher mentioned. So I'm going to ask Asher first, Asher first, then I'm going to go to you, Marlon. And that is this narrative around Black men and mental health, that it is mm. not a path of healing for you, that it is not available and not because of any other reason than like pride. I kind of think of it as the Black people's machismo. Like it's not something that is available because you have to be strong at all points, because you cannot cry, because you don't got time, you don't got the luxury to feel these feelings um, or to have mental health issues. And also in our communities, if, if either of you are from religious communities, I know you've heard this, that basically you're a sinner and that's why you got some mental health issue. Like, mm -hmm. and you just need to pray it away. You need to go pray away your depression or your anxiety or whatever it is. Um, and same with with substance abuse, that this is something that you brought on yourself. And, mm. um, you know, there's no such thing as as kind of mental health. And there's no such thing as, you know, going to a therapist and telling people your problems. You got to keep your business to yourself. I wonder for both of you how you came to find um support through mental wellness and the various whether that was therapy and counseling or support groups or medication or whatever it was i wonder what was that breaking point for you where you had to think beyond these narratives that were told in communities of color around mental health um so that you could start your own healing the reason why i started actually i started going counseling i didn't i didn't do it in the military I didn't do much of it. And I got home, hanging out with my sister. She actually close by right now too. But but she was like, actually, you're not the same. I'm like, ah. I'm like, okay, well, let me go talk to somebody. So I started having a conversation right now with my therapist. I started going to a therapist, kind of talk. And there's a lot of things that's happening in my life. I'm going to talk about this one area that I really want to want to work on myself. It's sleep. I don't sleep well. And and that's because I have a lot of, I used to get a lot of nightmares back in the day before. I like back in 2008 because I've been, Deployments like five times already since I'm older my 22 years. But I wasn't sleeping well because I have nightmares. And for me to really get over that stuff, I had to do some different things to kind of keep myself from going to sleep. So I had a lot of sleep exhaustion too. But this will really happen. My my uh my therapist asked me this question. She was like, Asher, are you afraid of going to sleep? And it's like a you other question. I never thought about it. Am I afraid of going to sleep? And I was like, oh my God, actually I am. I am afraid of going to sleep. And I, and I start going back and reflecting on my life and connecting the dots. I realized when I start stop going to sleep, it was because I went, I did a 15 month deployment in Afghanistan and it was a lot of stuff that happened down there, but you know, a couple of folks really left, so forth and so on. But I realized I was not, I was not, I, did, I was trying to forget all of that stuff. And then it would start showing up in my dreams, my nightmares. I was stuff started waking me up when I'm asleep. So what I started doing, I started overhydrating my bladder at night. And because my bladder was overhydrated, I wake up like within three hours after going to sleep. So now I was preventing myself from having those nightmares by not staying asleep too long. And after over a decade and a half doing that, it started messing with my memory, my cognitive stuff now, because I wasn't getting a lot of sleep. 
But when I start going back to therapy and I start having a conversation, I'm like, oh my God, there's so much I need to work on on myself. But I wouldn't see that if I was keep toughing away, keep doing in the military. Because even in the military, you just keep doing, 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 doing until you just burn out. And I got a 22 years and I was burned out. I was like, I got to get out of this thing, man. I'm at, at least about 19 years, I was like, I'm done. I can't go no further. Like, I'm done. And I had to leave that community. But I realized it was always affecting my mindset. And I started working on other things. So I do a lot of reading, though, to kind of help myself. But that was part of the journey. Over to you. Oh, uh, <laughs> when Ashley was speaking, one of the things that caught me was the 22 years. And I was like, I keep thinking about the 23. And I'm like, what? what is it about once you get past those two decades of going through the same thing? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and experiencing the same results, it 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 does some it did something for me. And uh, Whitney, I think that's where it was for me when I realized, and I started looking around and saying, I've been in here, maybe not uh at you know at one uh consistent time, but over periods of time, I've been here longer than a lot of people with with murder charges. I, I've done a life sentence. When is enough enough? Um, and so. And finding, you know, how to, to get to the mental health side of it, I said, you know, there's nothing else I can do for myself. I have to find, you know, what is what is wrong with me that made me go get the education, to put the education behind it. And well, I forgot while you were speaking about one of the things, you know, when we come out of prison with those numbers, I have a personal vendetta. And that is to get DR in front of my name where I had inmate numbers behind it. I'm a few years away from getting that doctorate. So um, I'm going to get it. And I'll be Dr. Marlon Baker where I used to be inmate number something, 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 right? But um, back to that about the the time and and knowing when is enough is enough. That's that's what happened to me, Ashley. The same thing. I just said, you know, it, it's enough. And uh I got out and I started wanting to understand me better. I started reading the research behind it. Instead of just going to the classes, letting them push information in me and saying, hey, maybe this will work, maybe this will, because everything's theory. Um, I said, let me go and research and find out myself what's going to work. And one of the things, I think I said it on our last taping, y'all, was Addiction Neuroscience 101. It's on YouTube. It's called Addiction Neuroscience 101 the most informative thing I've seen in my 30 years of addiction. You got to watch it. It helps explain the disease behind the addiction that it's, it's, you know, not something that we can say, Hey, you have a choice. Uh, it's more science behind it. It shows the brain waves behind the interactions. Once someone puts that chemical and makes that chemical and uh, change in, in the brain, how it affects them. So uh, definitely after that amount, large amount of time, uh, loss of life I had to make it different wow yeah thank you I know you're gonna get that doctorate too um, <laughs> thank, oh yeah <laughs> that I, man is I, determined I, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah I got school stuff popping up on my screen as we talk I got some classes due tonight y'all I'm on my way <laughs> mm -hmm. get, get 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 what I, you get your PhD and your PHB, because you know this this two acronym that I kind of kind of use to kind of get the binary tension between you know the philosophy in doing and the philosophy in being. And we was talking about the the reflective part of the stuff. What I do a lot now because I'm after I retired is really like to sit back and reflect on my journey, kind of the dots. So I, I I work on my PHB now, my philosophy in being me. Like how do I be Asher, the guy that I want to finish the next forty two years of my life being. You know what I'm saying? I say 42 because my checkout date is 86. And you, some people say, you don't know when you're going to die. I pick mine. I, <laughs> I say, I'm leaving at 86. And, it, and if I get to 85 and you're like, hold on, bro, my mind's still short, body still strong, I might renegotiate, right? But right now, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to 86. So, you know, Marty, talk about your doctorate. Pick, pick your number. You know, like, I got this much time to get that doctorate, right? But yeah, yeah. Well, same thing here, man. I'm, I'm working on mine, too. But education is very important. Like you said, very important. Yes. Very important. I, I didn't realize how much um, I missed out in my youth because I did, wasn't doing a lot of reading, a lot of, a lot of studying other people's model and figure out, okay, oh, what what can I extract from it to put implement in my life? And I started doing that. I'm like, okay, finding people that think like me or, or have the same challenges I have and how they master it and start focusing on their model and implement it. Marlon did something that I think most of us don't have the courage to do. And that is uh, how I understand it is he realized something wasn't right and that he needed to remove himself and focus on himself 
so that he can get right, so that he can live the life that he wants to live, so that he can mm. pursue his goals Mental and his reset. dreams. Exactly. Yes. And so that yes. he can be the man he wants to be for his fiance. So Marlon, tell us about that. Okay, so Christmas time, we had the beautiful Christmas party at the house three stories and, and a jazz player walking up and down the steps playing jazz. Christmas was wonderful. And uh, not soon after that, there's a thing called seasonal depression. Um, for those that don't know, seasonal mental Bad. health disorders. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And it happens during certain times of the year. So um, I, after that Christmas party, it felt like I had nothing left in me for the new year. And I needed to recharge. I call it a reset and refocus. I have a friend who runs a a, a home, a, a home for people returning from prison. So that population I know, and it helps them with mental health, addiction, but also to get a foundation. Go to groups. You're you're out in the mountains. It's a beautiful thing. I call it God's country, Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. For anybody visiting Virginia, you've got to go to Shenandoah Valley, Appalachian Mountains. It's beautiful. Uh, and so I called him uh, at the beginning of January. I didn't let I didn't want 2024 to start off wrong. And I took myself out of the of course. Everyone might not have the uh financial ability to say, you know, I'm going to leave my partner and go away. But the benefit of being there is it's also a work camp a work, you know, where you get to work and, and uh, also, you know, help provide for yourself. Or if you have a home and a family, be able to bring something back home to them. So it was a win-win for me. I got to reset, refocus. The fiance was happy because she got to get some money when I got home. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we, we, you know, I, I did it. And uh, like I said, it, it was the best thing I could have done for this year. I'm starting this year out strong. I have a great foundation. Took myself away from everything because I was committing to too much. Um, and uh, I think I said this in the previous podcast, September had this post up on my Facebook page. I'm speaking at three colleges, going to this jail, this rehab, this home. And and I looked at it and realized I said yes to too much stuff. And it was around that time that I started breaking down right before the holidays because I was over committing. I didn't know how to say no. And that's something for someone dealing with uh, substance use, mental health addiction, um, the guilt and shame, it, it will destroy, it will destroy me. It will destroy us. So we have to be careful that we're not operating out of that guilt and shame, even for the time being incarcerated and away from home or serving time for our, our country and being away from, from our families and over committing and saying yes to family when we get home and doing too much because, hey, we took a we took an oath to do something else or we had a disease that was holding us back from doing what we should have been doing. Mm. Mm. I can so relate um, to the overextending. And tell, us about, tell us about that, Whitney. Tell us about that. <laughs> Man, when I say that I'm in the season of no right now, mm. um, and I say that, but as I say that, I'm also actively working to get a second business off the ground. So, <laughs> like, but it is, I do have to recognize frequently where I am overextended. And so now I've started um, doing a new practice, which is looking at my calendar every Sunday. Um, if there is, if something has not been scheduled for the week by Sunday, I'm not scheduling it for the week. Um, I'm scheduling it for the week after. And that's because by the time my Sunday comes, my weeks are still, you know, three, four, five meetings a day, um, which is too much. I can't speak that much in a day. And um, with podcasting in particular, you know, I've had to learn how to balance different types of engagements so that I'm not doing too much of one thing. I'm not talking too much today or I'm not up and moving around too much today. So it's been a journey trying to find the balance. But I definitely, you know, in season one of my podcast, I had an episode where I talked about my anxiety and my overwhelm. I had stopped taking my medication. I don't, it ran out and I just wasn't paying attention to it. And I take an anti-anxiety medication, 
I've taken it since um, my second child was born because I started taking it for postpartum depression. He's now three. And I was kind of just like, do I even really need this anymore? Like, I'm not sure. I'm not certain that I need this. So I stopped taking this medication because it ran out and I just didn't care to get it refilled. I was also experiencing a tough situation at work. I was also getting the podcast off the ground and staying up into the wee hours to edit videos and edit audio. Long story short, I started having vertigo. I started mm. um, having, my skin was literally crawling. Like it was crawling, it was itchy. I have um, eczema, my eczema flared up. I had just a variety of physical sensations that were telling me that my mental health was not right. And my anxiety, of course, because I wasn't on the medications, was all over the place. So I would be up for hours like spinning, thinking about something that didn't deserve my 4 a.m. in the morning hours, you know? Um, so that was in, I think, October, last fall, October, 2023. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, a lot of things have happened. Um, one of which was I realized I needed my medication. So I got back on my medication and I take that religiously. But I also have been working on like somatic meditation, which mm -hmm. is really being more in tune with my body is really what this means for me. Trying to take cues from my body as to when things don't feel right. For example, yesterday, for some reason, I just felt sluggish. I felt sluggish. I felt a little bit nauseous. I felt um, just not great. So I literally was on the couch and in bed all day. And if the kids want to play with me, then they can play with me right here on the couch. If you want to <laughs> watch TV with me, then you can mm -hmm. find me upstairs in my bed. But I ain't doing none of what y'all want to do. <laughs> um, and and that has been, it still is extremely difficult for me to take mm -hmm. the time, to take the space, to practice like actual self-care as opposed to the every now and again getting my nails done or every mm -hmm. now and then every now and then going to a coffee shop and having time with myself. Like I am needing to practice things on almost a daily basis and it'll look different from day to day. Like Sundays, it'll be looking at my calendar. Mondays, it'll be somatic meditation. Tuesdays, it might be, um, you know, reevaluating my calendar for the week and seeing, you know, just taking a second to see how I feel. It might mean ordering out dinner because I don't have it in me to cook today. And allowing myself the grace to do that. And I think really what the season has been about has been adapt adaptation and flexibility um, for the sake of guarding my self-care, my mental wellness, acknowledging that I am human and cannot do all the things. Um, so Asher, what about you? What are, what are some things that you do to take care of yourself when you get there? And <laughs> and I wanted to ask Asher before he went on, because I, I made the mistake of speaking for him about coming home and having the guilt and shame to do all these things. I don't know if that was the case, but Asher, if you want to speak on that, let me know if I was correct or, or did I give a good assumption of what you what happened when you, you know, after your service and then you were back around family again. The, the, one of the biggest thing was for me was not to let my family down. That's one of the biggest thing that used to drive me when I was in. Let my mom down, especially because she had nine kids. She got us off the island of Jamaica to America. And, you know, we all go through a lot of stuff. So I was like, every time I get in trouble, I used to get in trouble in the military too, right? I'm like, oh man, if my mom know what I'm doing right now, she would not be happy. She would not, she would, you know, so, so, so definitely was, there was always the, the mom guilt on you, like not letting your mom down, right? Like your parents yeah. and so forth and so on. But like when I came, when I came back home too, same thing. Yes, I was, I've been gone. I haven't seen a lot of my family a lot over the years. And I don't remember a lot of things either because I haven't done a lot of conversation with them where like they, they all go to memory lane, they get together, go to memory lane, you know, go back home and visit the, the past. I haven't done a lot of that. So I, I forget a lot of that stuff. I was like, hey, Ash, do you remember this? And like, no, I don't remember it because I've been gone so long. So that part was kind of challenging too. So I'm here trying to get back, get my history back, like get erase some of this mystery about my history because I don't remember it. And they mm -hmm. know it because they've been talking about it longer than I have. But the question for Whitney, what was your question again, Whitney? What does self-care look like for you? Like, how oh. do you, because we talked about that Marlon 
just took himself out of a situation mm -hmm. for this reset. Um, and I have various things that I that I try and do. Mm -hmm. I'm not perfect. Um, so Asher, <laughs> what do you do? What works for you? The the short answer is I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of reading or listen to books because that helps my mind because for some reason I'm cursed with the lack of sleep, the sleep exhaustion piece right now. I don't really sleep much. Like I'm just being honest. I don't I don't get a lot of sleep. So my mind is always turned about thinking about something. And I I think I'm cursed. I think I might be to relieve my curse back in 2026. I think that's the date I'm gonna maybe get over this thing. But right now, I have just so much energy and passion for the learning space that I'm just learning so much stuff. I just I can't turn my mind off. So I know I'm just only sleeping for so many hours, but I'm gonna focus on that. But after that, after I get to that that process, then I can I can move in that space. But but I, what I need now is sleep. I need sleep. I'm not getting it, but I know I get it. I'll get it eventually. So as far as me taking care of myself, mm, I'm not doing a great of a job doing that right now. I would I would say I'm not doing a great of a job, not doing a great of a job. But I'm really. But you're honest it. about it at least. Yeah, yeah. So I'm work. I'm working the mental piece. That's also I'm working the mental health piece. Big part. <laughs> so Marlon, where where uh -huh. can folks find you if they want to connect with you? Yes, please, Marlon Baycoat on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Baycoat Marlon on Instagram. Uh, TikTok, one of those Marlon Bacos. You type in my name, you're going to find me. M-A-R-L-O-N-B-A-C-O-T-E. I'm on all social media platforms. My book, Lighting the Way, Hidden Treasures, is on Amazon Kindle. Thank you, Whitney, and thank you, Asher, for this time to share my story. And I hope I inspired someone and a quick message to the family members, the mothers, the spouses, the siblings, the, just the friends of people suffering Uh because someone has an addiction or mental health issue, there is hope. Never give up on that person because I am one who lived through it. And right before my mother stroked, I was clean and sober. And I was the one that went to hospital and signed that paper so she could live another two years. Nobody else was available except for the one who had been in the street and been in prison dealing with drugs. So there's hope. Don't give up, y'all. Love y'all. Spread hope. Mm, thank you. And Asher, yeah. how about you? I know we're on your platform right now, but where can folks who are listening, maybe on Impostrix podcast, where can they find you? Oh, yeah. So lifechangingwisdom.com. Don't put a www. Just lifechangingwisdom.com. Just search me. you find me out there in the world. That's that's my coaching platform. And I'm on Instagram, asher.ra.sta. Trying, trying to be a live platform too. And I should write on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. Awesome. And also, yeah, it's. I just want to leave. I just want to leave a quick, a quick, um, quick inspiration here because I will. Marlon talked about lighting the way and the treasure and the trauma and so forth and so on. And this is something I keep telling myself: I am too self. I am too selfish with my trauma to have you visit them, but I'm very generous with my treasures to us, so I choose to share them with you. And every day I get up, I find a way to kind of find this, this, the thing about my story that's resonating with other people and share it with them. Because I realize that, you know, I'm I'm in the I'm in the marketing space too, where I'm understanding the process of of sharing story and how people buy buy your story. I was talking to my partner. She was saying, Asher, don't try to sell the product, sell the product. No, talk about the story, experience with it, because that's what people buy. So when people understand your experience with that product or service, they're like, oh my god, I want that same story for myself too, and they're gonna get the product, they're gonna get the person. They're going to connect with that thing that gave that person that story so they can buy it into that story because they want that story for themselves. I'm like, oh, my God. So now, say with other people, you have your own story, and other people want to buy into your story, but how you sell it is by sharing it. You're going to share with other people so people can understand it because they see themselves in you. Like, I'm looking for people that I see myself in based on my my identities that I, I see in the world. I look, I look for other people that reflect the same thing, and I study them. Master their model and their tools. And my life become a lot better. Over to you, Whitney. Mm, thank, thank you. you. Thank yes. you. So um, folks interested in listening to Impostrix Podcast, you can find me at www.impostrixpodcast.com. Impostrix spelled I-M-P-O-S-T-R-I-X podcast.com. I'm also on Instagram, TikTok, all the all the social medias. Um and I have, hopefully by the time I release this episode, um, I will have started another business and we'll be able to tell y'all about that. Um, I got lots of good things planned. So congratulations. stay tuned. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all. Until next time, be validated.
Uh, All right. Deuces, y'all. Thanks so much for joining me for this conversation. I hope that you got as much out of it as I did. Feel free to continue the conversation with us over on Facebook at the Impostrix Podcast Validating Space. We welcome all, and it's a space for us to validate each other as we work through work, race, and imposter syndrome. You can find out more about me or about the podcast at www.impostrixpodcast.com. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Podcast. Until next time, be validated.